Our holy gospel comes from the Gospel of John. Jesus said to the Jews, Is my mic on? Okay, you're good. All right. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, Jesus, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. Well, today, as you know, is Reformation Sunday. This is the day where we celebrate uh, what Martin Luther did in starting the Protestant Reformation uh, in 1517. So we celebrated the 500th anniversary in 2017, right? Martin Luther is, he allegedly nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the castle church. Of course, scholars have kind of ruined that now and said, maybe he didn't nail it, but that's okay. We have the image of Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And uh, these 95 Theses were all about reforming the church. Luther never intended to leave the Catholic church. He just wanted to make it better for, um, for people, especially those on the margins. And the theses were a lot about this practice of indulgences where people would kind of buy um, the salvation for their loved ones or for themselves. And Luther had a real problem with that because, um, one, you can't earn your salvation, right? And two, it was the, he felt like the church was stealing money from people who really needed that money to buy food or things like that. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. There's a lot more to it than that. But the Reformation is what we celebrate today, and that's how the Lutheran Church was formed, because although Luther never wanted to leave the Catholic Church, they didn't want him around anymore after that. And one of the readings that we always read on Reformation Sunday, we read the same readings every year, a reading from Jeremiah, a reading from Romans, John's Gospel, and the same psalm that Pastor Daniel said was Luther's favorite psalm. Well, the reading from Jeremiah that John read, it says, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This reading is really important in the book that, written by the prophet Jeremiah, because this is kind of a doom and gloom book, and this comes in a small section of hope. It's actually called the little book of comfort within a big book of kind of doom and gloom, right? Jeremiah is the prophet who's also... Um, believed to have maybe written Lamentations, and he is known as the weeping prophet. So he's not necessarily an eternal optimist, um, and most of the book is about how um, Israel is going to be destroyed by the Babylonian Empire, and he's right. They were. And so this book of comfort in the midst of all of that, it's all about hope. It's a few chapters where he really hones in on hope. It's about hope for a restored relationship and forgiveness with God. It's about hope for a new future. So with that in mind, let's do that again. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. These are people in exile, and God is saying, I will write my law, my teachings on their hearts. And this is really interesting because it's the same law. The law hasn't changed. It's the Torah. It's the same law. It's the same teaching to love God and to love your neighbor, and it's the same God. But this new covenant, this new frame of hope that Jeremiah gives, it takes new shape. And that's really what reform is. It's like modeling clay, right? It's taking something, it's still the same thing, but you give it a new shape. And, and, it, and it gives hope when that hope is needed. And that's what um, these verses are about, this new shape being written on their hearts, this new way being written on the hearts of the people that they know that God is with them, and they know they can carry that teaching as they go. And I want to talk about how our church is starting to take new shape too. Um, and our church is starting to reform, re, 
reform as well. Um, this may not be as apparent in our particular congregation because um, as we've talked about in our stewardship videos and as we talk about in our magazines and all of that, things are pretty good here at CTK. It's a great place to be. We're a growing congregation. Uh, we, share, uh, we share grace and love, and we talk about all these things. But the ELCA as a whole is kind of struggling right now, and we may be a little shielded from that. So I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. Um, the ELCA is a denomination that was founded in 1988, so it's actually not as old as many people think. It was a merger between three denominations. Let's see if I can get this right. The American Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Church of America, and the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. <laughs> they all merged in 1988, and they all had to compromise, right? So the ELCA, no one was ever totally satisfied with what came out of that merger, right? None of those three branches. Um, and so it's been a long time now. It's been 30-some years. We don't live in the same world as the world was in the 80s. And in this year, in the wake of COVID, a lot of churches are seeing decline. And there's also been a lot of incidents, well, a few incidents that have been really big of racism in our church, of bureaucracy kind of getting in the way of communities of color in particular being harmed um, by that bureaucracy in some ways. And so at our churchwide assembly that happened recently, um, one of the things that is coming out of the, that is this resolution that was voted on. It says that the ELCA Church Council will establish a commission for a renewed Lutheran church to reconsider the statements of purpose for each expression of this church, the principles of organizational structure, and our shared commitment to dismantle racism with findings to be reported at the 2025 Churchwide Assembly in preparation for a possible reconstituting convention. So that's a lot of lingo, right? Speaking of bureaucracy, right? We want reform, so we're going to make a commission to focus on reform and see what that will look like, right, um, in 2025 when the next Churchwide Assembly is. Um, I don't know what's going to happen out of this. No one really does. I don't even know if this commission has been formed yet, um, but I want it to be on your radar. Uh, Pastor Daniel mentioned that the church is never perfect, and we are always reforming and always being made new in the welcome, and our church is doing that right now. It's being made new. No one knows what that newness will look like, what it will entail, but we are reforming right now as a church. We've said we, this is not good enough, and we need to do better. We need to be better, and so Let's try to figure out together what that can look like. Um, so there could be a whole new church in 2025, or there could be, who knows what's going to happen. But I just want you to know that we are in the midst of reformation in our church right now. But just like with the new covenant in Jeremiah, it's the same church. It's the same teaching about grace and forgiveness and God's love. It's the same God with maybe a new frame or a new shape. That's what reform is, taking that clay and making something new, taking what's there and forming it into something new. Um, in our gospel lesson from John this morning, Jesus says, the truth will make you free. And of course the people say, we were, we're not, we, we're, we've always been free, what are you talking about, right? And we always talk in our confessions that, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? And Jesus says that anyone who sins is a captive to sin, is enslaved by sin. And in John's gospel, this sin is an estrangement. It's a separation. And so what he's saying is that connection and relationship, the truth that, that those things are good and that, that what comes from that will make us free. Well, we know we've struggled with what the truth really is lately. Um, so let's look at what Luther holds to be truth. He says, even if you were nothing but good works, from the soles of your shoes to the top of your head, you would not be righteous, worship God, or fulfill the first commandment. For your God cannot be worshipped rightly unless you ascribe to God that which God is due. The glory of the truthfulness and all goodness, however, this cannot be done by works, but only by faith of the heart. 
truth and freedom come through faith. They come through relationship. They come through connection, not estrangement or separation. And reform, when we make reforms, we want to make reforms for the sake of relationship, for the sake of relationship with our history, for the sake of relationship with our future, for the sake of relationship with God, for the sake of the relationship with the world, for the sake of relationship with those who are oppressed in our midst. That's what reform is about, being better for the sake of connection, for the sake of relationship. And that faith is of the heart. This faith is written on our hearts. This teaching is written on our hearts as Lutherans. We carry this with us. It's not about works. It's not about what we do. It's about how we respond to that grace and to that faith and to that love that God shares so freely with us. And so Jesus says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Through faith in Jesus, we are free. We are connected. We are a relational people, a relational church. We are free to be. But then, of course, Luther has to make it a little complicated and give a paradox here, right? Insofar as a Christian is free, no works are necessary. And insofar as a Christian is servant, all kinds of works are done. Luther says we are totally free, subject to none, And we are also subject to God and to one another as a response to that freedom. Through grace, we are free from all of these things. We are free from greed. We are free from shame. We are free from perfection, from having to have it all figured out, from having to know what's going to happen in 2015, from having to never make mistakes in church. We are free from abuse, from abuse of power over from abuse that um, people on the margins receive, we are free in God. We are free from our need to prove our need to be worthy. We are free from all of that. And out of that freedom, out of that grace, out of that love shared with us so freely, we are free to reform. We are free to look for a better way. We are free to take chances on molding that clay and to seeing what's going to come next. We are free to love ourselves. We are free to love one another and to show that love in tangible, real ways. We are compelled to do that because we know that God first loved us. We are free to imagine what that clay could be shaped into. We are free to imagine a new way. We are free to imagine what the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst. And we are free to be. We are free to be ourselves. We are free to be beloved. We are free to be held and cradled by God's grace and God's love. Amen.